Great, thank you very much, Sean. It's a great pleasure to be here today and give you an overview of our year two activities. I'm so excited to see everyone here today, especially our faculty PIs and our students, as well as our national lab points of contact. Our background and motivation lies in nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear safeguards. And so we're addressing some of the gaps and challenges that still exist uh, around the world to curb the fast growing expansion of nuclear capabilities in states around the world. As we know, after the Manhattan Project, there was a fast growing expansion of capabilities and we had several treaties that were negotiated and put into place to try to curb that expansion. And so our consortium for verification technology aims at developing new technologies that will be used to verify both existing treaties and as well as new uh, proposed treaties. So we have a fantastic team of 12 universities and these have been selected because they are the best of the best around the country at doing what they're doing. And it's a very interdisciplinary team because these challenges really require people to work together from different disciplines and come together and address these challenges. Our mission is the advancement of the state of the art in these technologies that are related to verification of treaties, as well as training the next generation of nuclear professionals. We're in need of uh, new talent that uh, will work in these areas both in the national lab system, as well as industry and academia. And so we are developing this next generation of students. So it's a five-year program, and uh, you see the universities in the map here. We have uh, partners, MIT, Columbia University, Yale University, Princeton University, Duke, NC State, uh, Oregon State, Illinois, Wisconsin, Hawaii, and University of Florida. And each of these universities is represented here at the workshop. Our universities are working closely with the national labs and our national lab points of contact are here to make that connection and transition of students and technologies to the national labs. So what do we expect? It's a five year project and we're just you know, finishing the second year, we have three more years to go. What do we expect at the end of these five years? Well, we'll have a deep understanding of policy and technology. So in addition to technology development, you know, with scientists working at the labs, we have a strong connection with a policy component. Uh, we really want to understand the policy and possibly help inform new policies and um, needed for treaty verification. We're working on the next set of algorithms, computational capabilities for these problems. And of course, new, uh, more sensitive and accurate uh, detection systems, experiments capabilities needed for treaty verification. So when we wrote a proposal, we said, well, maybe we'll have about 60 students coming out of this program. Well, we've already upped that to about 80, and I'll show you that we have, we're gonna have many more coming out of this program. Here's our org chart. So we're thankful to NNSA for their support. Uh, I'm honored to be the consortium director. And uh, my assistant director, Sean Clark, and project manager, John Rodriguez, are fantastic. Our chief scientist, Professor David Weehy, and our university PI board, representing each of the 12 universities, and our national lab points of contact are also advising us. Advisory board members are here with us today. And then we're organized by thrust areas. So we have six thrust areas, and each of those thrusts is led by a university uh, PI. So our thrust areas are working together to enable uh, our outcomes here. So the first thrust area is our policy thrust. We really want to understand the policy uh, that we're working to address. So thrust area one informs the other thrust areas. And then we have uh, four technical thrusts. They include fundamental data and techniques, where we're really developing these new algorithms to analyze the data from all of these different types of sensors that are coming at us. 
We're developing new algorithms. That's cross-cutting over the other technical thrust areas. Thrust area three is our advanced safeguards tools for accessible facilities. So how can we detect things in facilities where we have access? So think about IEA type work. Thrust area four is detection of undeclared activities in inaccessible facilities where we are looking at state actors that might be developing a weapons program. How can we detect that effectively? And then thrust area five is our disarmament verification. One of the pillars of the MPT talks about disarmament. So how do we verify that states are actually disarming uh, nuclear weapons? Finally, all of our thrusts will uh, trickle into that education and outreach thrust, where we educate the next generation of students by involving them in these cutting edge projects with our national lab partners. So a little bit more on our uh, topics of interest. We have this dichotomy where we want to allow states to pursue peaceful energy programs. And at the same time, we know that we have states that have existing weapons stockpiles. And we'd like to avoid, what's shown here at the bottom, another nuclear detonation. Okay, we'd like to avoid that. And so uh, these are all the various uh, you know, pathways where we could get to another destination. And what is also shown here is our thrust areas and how they come to address all of those different pathways uh, to try to avoid this outcome. So I don't have time, and we will hear in the next couple of days a lot about our research projects. I just want to give you a few highlights from a few of the thrust areas. So uh, in our thrust area on fundamental physics and data, we're addressing some of the needs that are cross-cutting across various of the thrust areas. We're looking to study the physics of fission. And you would think that by now we know everything about fission. It's been discovered uh, a few decades ago now. However, we still have a need for nuclear data, specifically looking at correlated emissions from fission events, gammas and neutrons coming out of fission. And in this particular project, we are working with our collaborators at Los Alamos and Livermore to really address these needs. We're also looking at new systems to do imaging, an advanced image reconstruction. So at the bottom right, you see some examples of how we can with a radiation imager, determine where a source is located within a room or a building. And obviously that's very important for our non-proliferation capabilities to say where is a source and characterize a source. What is that source? And so you can see an example here of how our algorithms can actually improve the imaging capabilities for a given detector. In safeguards, we're working closely uh, with the DAF, or the Device Assembly Facility, to conduct experiments. These are some of the first university-led experiments on Category 1 special nuclear material that have been performed. And our students are very excited to actually go out there and measure with the instruments that they've been develop developing, measure actual special nuclear material. So get them out of the laboratory in the university where they have only access to, say, a California source, and now really measure with the real stuff. And it's really exciting uh, for the students to do these types of experiments. You can see a photograph here from uh, the last campaign that happened at DAF. Uh, this was just this past summer where we actively interrogated highly enriched uranium and were able to detect it. So another technical highlight has to do with the analysis of uh, weapons explosions in North Korea. And here you see some of the work that we're doing in this area. At the top right, you see a few seismograms that represent what was recorded in China, at a station in China, um, for the various North Korean explosions. And so our collaborators are evaluating these seismograms specifically looking at their amplitudes, 
to determine what was the yield of the explosion that, was, that happened. And was it indeed a nuclear explosion? And can we distinguish that from other earth trembles, such as, say, an earthquake? And that's a very challenging problem, especially for low yield explosions and distinguishing that from a natural, natural event, such as an earthquake. The bottom right, you see an example of uh, some of our efforts in radionuclide uh, transport and looking at um, the event that happened in Fukushima, that ac Fukushima accident, and uh, looking at how the plume moves in the atmosphere according to atmospheric models. Uh, this graph shows, at the top right here, shows some radio xenon data. So we're working with PNL to analyze data from radio xenon, and this is a, a signature that the event was indeed a nuclear event. So we're analyzing and developing a new radio xenon detectors that could be used uh, for this purpose. So the final technical highlight I want to share with you is, has to do with future disarmament treaties. So this is a really interesting problem where we want to verify that the object is indeed a weapon without revealing any classified information about the object. So it's a very interesting um, measurement system development. So you want to find out enough about an object, but not too much about it. And so here we're uh, developing uh, so-called zero knowledge protocols. Protocols where we can verify without giving away knowledge about the object. And you see an example of HEU experiments that we did at the DAF using a DD neutron generator, interrogating this object, inducing fission, and then using non-electronic detectors to detect uh, the neutrons coming off of this experiment. MIT is uh, looking at, a, at an approach that has to do with uh, NRF, or nuclear resonance fluorescence, where we can look at the actual uh, NRF peaks that are characteristic of isotopes. And in their approach, we have a witness foil method whereby we don't directly measure the weapon, but we, we just look at this NRF signature through this witness foil. And we'll hear more about that approach. So of course, we're professors, we're in academia, and we like to publish uh, our work. We really uh, encourage our students to publish in peer-reviewed journals, and we're very active in this. And so far in the first two years, we've had 70 publications, including uh, an article that recently came out in The New Yorker. So it was just very exciting to see that our work being recognized in the press like that. And uh, our very own um, Alex Glazer uh, in a photograph on The New Yorker. Our fellows and associates, our students, are uh, just fantastic. You'll meet many of them in these couple of days. You see a photograph of some of them here. And this is the participation in the CBT by quarter in the last two years. So as you can see, um, we've had some growth. We started with about 60 students and postdocs, and we're now up to about 83. And we classify our students as fellows or associates. And the fellows are fully funded by the CBT, and the associates are partially funded. So sometimes our national lab sponsors will have a project where they'd like to fund a student, and that really helps us because now we can fund and integrate another student in our CBT. So we like to encourage that as much as possible. Our students go on internships, and the internships vary in length from uh, two, three months up to even longer periods, like six months or more, where they work at the national labs. And we've had 47 internships uh, since the beginning of the project. Here you see some photographs of some of our students working at the labs with our lab mentors. So in addition to having students go out to the labs, we have our national lab uh, 
collaborators coming to the university. And so we've instituted what we think is the first of its kind, a fellowship for national lab scientists to spend time at the university. And this has been very successful. We've had five of these uh, types of fellowships that we gave out. And we have an online call for 2017. So if you're interested in spending some time, and these can vary from a week to several weeks, depending on um, the project, uh, to come and visit one of our universities and work with our students. So here's our CBT advancement model. So we start working with our students early, perhaps even as undergraduates, and getting them interested in, in the topics of nonproliferation and safeguards. Then, um, you know, we get them involved in the CBT, get them to do an internship at the lab, and this is an example of a particular student that went on to become staff at Los Alamos, Alexis Trahan. Cal Hartig, this is another example, uh, went to um, Oregon State and Penn State and then became a CBT associate and went on to become a professor, an assistant professor at the University of Florida. That's also a great outcome, training the next generation. Kyle Pollock, who's now a senior staff member at Sandia National Labs. So, I want to conclude, summarize here. Uh, it's been a fantastic two years. We've had many accomplishments. You see them all listed here. Uh, workshops, we hosted UITI. Um, we've had many internships and outreach events, even to the public, and even uh, reaching out to students as young as middle school age students, teaching them about radiation detection and getting them interested in physics uh, early on. So here we are. So we're marching along. We're at the end of year two. We've initiated our project, recruited the students, developed these university and national lab collaborations. We're beginning to advance in phase two and demonstrate our technologies. You will see some technologies in action during our demonstrations today, and I hope you, uh, you enjoy that and give feedback to, to, the, um, to the technology developers. And uh, finally, in year four and five, we will transition the most promising technologies to the labs and to industry. And uh, these are our outcomes that you see here at the bottom, our CBT fellows and associates, interested in these uh, technology areas and transitioned into the labs or industry. And on the right, you know, you see the, the advancement in technology and uh, these transition to federal and state agencies, national labs, and industry. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and ask if you have any questions. Uh, you have the important benefit of accessibility uh, to avoid costly and potentially uh, risky disruptions to real facilities. And of course, uh, there's the added benefit of being ab um, able to better collaborate.